Hi, I'm Michael Everts, and this is Fit to Be Read. My recommendations today are science fiction books from the 2000s. First up is Fallen Dragon by Peter F. Hamilton, published in 2001. My favorite Hamilton novel is Judas Unchained, which happens to be the sequel to Pandora's Star. Most of my favorite Hamilton novels are parts of series. I've got Fallen Dragon on the list because it's an entertaining Hamilton read, and it's a rare standalone. Hamilton puts the economics of space travel, exploration, and colonization at the center of this space opera. These things don't just pay for themselves. Space travel, light years in time and space is very expensive. Colonies will take hundreds of years to compensate investors. Some colonies even decide to just blow off their debt. Not surprising, most powerful in this universe are the mega corporations. They don't like debt. They like money, and they like getting paid back. These corporations will send their mercenary armies to the colonies, and they will, as they feel justified to do, loot their riches and their technology. Much of the story tracks Lawrence Newton, a sergeant in one of these corporate armies. Newton sets off to a target colony, but also has some ideas of his own. We're also treated to flashbacks of Newton's childhood and background that explains how he's become a corporate mercenary. Newton's path evolves to include a search for purpose. As with most Hamilton novels, guarantees here are great combat moments, imaginative and convincing future tech, strong plot, and interesting characters. I recommend this as a strong space opera with decent action, military sci-fi moments, and a very strong ending. Under the Dome by Stephen King, published in 2009, Two of my favorite King novels are two of his, I believe, most underappreciated or underrated books, The Running Man, penned under his pseudonym Richard Bachman, and Under the Dome. Under the Dome was turned into a TV series, so maybe it's not that underrated. Regardless, I liked it a lot. It was written in the 2000s, and it goes on the list. It probably first stoked my affection because it had some Robert Charles Wilson spin vibes, the idea of humans being enclosed or trapped inside of a dome of sorts. While not an exact parallel, this is a story where people are cordoned off, are aware of it, and that awareness strongly influences their behaviors and in some ways inspires baser instincts to take over. In Dome, the residents of a town in Maine find themselves trapped inside an invisible dome. We, they, nobody knows what this dome is or where it came from. They just know that they're trapped. On one hand, we need to find out what's going on and figure out a solution to the problem. On the other hand, we have a whole mini society inside affected by the new reality. The strength and focus of the story, much like in Spin, will be how the characters will survive, interact, and be affected by the new reality. A lot of this is human beings being human, and that's enough for me to recommend it. I might caution that there's not much of a science fiction feel in most of the storytelling, but because the dome is ever present in the world, I err towards saying the vibe ultimately exists or persists. Extra points for a terrific and detestable villain, Big Jim. How about Relic by Alan Dean Foster, published in 2018? It's finally happened. We've wiped ourselves out. Man-made plague, the aura malignance, has wiped out the entire human race, almost the entire human race. There's one man left standing, and his name is Ruslan. Somehow he was immune. He's alone, surviving on the planet Saraboth. He's eventually discovered by the three-legged, three-armed alien Masari. The Masari are pretty cool, and assuming that Ruslan is the last human being, they'd like to use their cloning technology to make more humans. They're not the only aliens that want to do this, but they do appear to be the most trustworthy. Ruslan's not enamored with the idea of volunteering to restore the human race, but he's not exactly saying no. He bargains with the Masari. Find the homeworld of the human race, Earth, and he'll play ball. A last human alive plot and future interstellar galactic setting with searching for the ancestral home of humans adventure are what led me to pick this up. Foster Delivers is a pretty safe bet with Last Man Alive books. Themes are not what they seem, and there will be some reveals. This novel is no different. I was first attracted to Foster's work after reading his excellent novelization of the Alien screenplay. Because of that read, I expected Relic to be a fast-paced interstellar thrill ride. There are elements of that, but the story is at times dense, and dense in a good way. Characters are realized. The aliens and their intentions are interesting, or at least curious. The world building is enjoyable. I'd recommend this as a first read to get acquainted with Alan Dean Foster. The Algebrist by Ian M. Banks, published in 2004. This is a great and vast space opera from Banks, one of his few that are not part of the Culture series. Banks sets us up in a star system where access to the greater galaxy is cut off because a wormhole has been sabotaged. 
Themes of isolation, uncertainty, and morality are forefront. There is a tension of war and conflict of ideas. The universe is full of intelligent alien races, which gives some idea of the heterogeneity of cultures that could swarm the galaxy. There is a complex galactic society, and these extraterrestrials are in and all over the strangest places, including the gas giants. The central character is a human who observes and interacts with some very special gas giant dwelling aliens, the dwellers. A discovery he makes initiates the invasion of his home system and a quest in search of ancient technology. It won't surprise you that the plot features galactic civilizations, intelligent alien races with different degrees of technological advancement, artificial intelligence, and interstellar war. This will feel a bit culture light, but in that regard, it's a good place to go if you've exhausted the culture series and are craving more banks. As a standalone, it does lack the depth of the larger, more impressive series. Extra points though for subtle and at times, absurd humor. Passage by Connie Wills, published in 2001. This is a story about life, death, living and dying, and the power and complexity of the human brain. The setup is pretty straightforward. Joanna, a neuropsychiatrist, is studying near-death experiences at a hospital. She's determined to find out how and why these occur. She will study brain chemistry, conduct interviews, and eventually team up with a neurologist who is similarly motivated their antagonist is the shady Mandrake. Mandrake is a best-selling author of spirituality and near-death experience books. His clear agenda is heavily religious, and his motives include all of the afterlife cliches, a bright light, long tunnel, Jesus, angels, and the pearly gates. Mandrake is not just a storyteller. He goes so far as to manipulate those who have had near-death experiences and suggest narratives for them to concede to, furthering his doctored work. The clash of ideas and practices between Joanna and Mandrake provide exciting conflict. Most exciting, however, is when Joanna takes the ultimate leap of devotion to her work and makes the ultimate sacrifice to further her research. At nearly 800 pages, I suspect that some will find that this is a little longer than it needs to be, but I think that the plot is engaging enough and the characters are interesting enough to hold most readers' attention. The Wind-Up Girl by Paolo Bacigalupi, published in 2009. If you're a fan of climate, enviro, biro, or dystopian fiction, this is probably a not-to-be-missed novel for you. The setting is future Thailand, and it's not a pretty picture. Sea levels have risen dramatically, most of the earth is a cesspool, and the fat cats still living large are the execs at the big seed companies. Biotech giants have cornered the market on disease-resistant agriculture, at least until diseases like blister rust and sibiscosis mutate or some other virus shows up. Thailand is rumored to have a non-GMO seed bank, and the stockpile of organic tech treasure will be well sought after. Chapters are split among a number of characters. Most notable are a seed exec sort of undercover in Thailand. Another follows a notorious rebel driven in part by a desire to protect the purity of his country. And maybe most notably, because she's the titular character, Amiko, a wind-up girl. Wind-up girls are bioengineered women created in Japan. And in Amiko's case, she ends up in Bangkok illegally and is forced to work in a brothel-like club, and she endures abusive and vile treatment. This is a fast-moving read, and it's sure to entertain. Ancillary Justice by Anne Leckie, published in 2013. Justice hosts a unique and original protagonist, Breck, also known as One-esque, and formerly and sometimes currently acknowledged as the transport ship, Justice of Torin. Breck began as a spaceship, the Justice of Torin. Breck is an artificial intelligence. The Justice of Torin, like other ships in this universe, fielded a league of ancillaries. Ancillaries are former human prisoners of war from conquered worlds who've been brainwashed. These human bodies have been fitted with implants and their cognitive function, individuality, sense of self has been replaced by the ship AI. The ancillaries are an extension of the ship. To say that they are the eyes and ears of the ship is a huge understatement on Nilt, the planet Nilt. Thousands of years in the future since the ship Justin of Torrens last existed, Breck is all that remains of the ship, the AI, and its ancillaries. It's made clear early on that Breck is on a mission of vengeance of sort, a quest for justice, that Breck continues on the icy planet Nilt. For much of the book, the story splits between two timelines. First is Breck on the planet Nilt, that leg of her quest, and then the second is a past timeline featuring Breck's flashback to an Imperial Reich, uh, that's the villain, uh, annexation of the planet Shizerna. 
It's in this flashback timeline that the size and the scope of the Justice of Torn and her ancillaries is revealed. Children of Time by Adrian Tchaikovsky, published in 2015. I think the reader that will click with this the most is somebody who likes space opera with people leaving a dying Earth, plans for terraforming planets, and things not going quite as planned. It's also a hit if you like themes of evolution in your science fiction, you like to spend time on a generational spaceship, and or if you're into AI. In Children of Time, there are two storylines. One follows the aftermath of a plan by a genetic scientist, Avrana Kern, to seed an alien world with uplifted primates. She's developed a virus that will hasten the evolutionary process for the primates, supposedly leading them to eventually civilizing and forming societies on a terraformed world. Things don't go according to plan, both for the primates and the ultimate effect of the virus, and for Dr. Kern. Dr. Kern will also have some issues with the AI technology that she brought with her to the star system. Also having an issue with that technology is the crew of the Ark ship Gilgamesh fleeing a nearly dead Earth and ending up, much later, in the vicinity of the terraformed planet and Kern's sort of failed experiment. The book alternates chapters between two storylines, that of the Ark ship Gilgamesh and its crew, and that of the activities and events happening on the terraformed planet over generations. Thank you for watching. I'm Michael Leverts, and this is Fit to be Read.